Thank you. Oh, thank you. No, I'm just... Oh, rock on. We have a water bottle that says rock on. Mine says super. Wow. Well... I think we should trade. <laughs> I think I should be rock on. Okay. You should be All right. super. But now we're set. <laughs> um, this is so nice. It's fun for me. I get to sit with you and talk to you and... I'll, mm -hmm. That's such a joy, even without all these people sitting I know, around, so. I know, and I, um, I really found when I found out that I was going to do this, which was really recently, I just sort of sat still for a second and thought about you and thought of all the things that I would want to ask you if I just had time to sit down. And, and actually, Michael's staying at our house, so we, we, have, we have been talking, but I think we've been pretty careful to not talk about this sort of stuff. I, I mean, I haven't noticed that We've talked about it. So no, if we have, you did it very subtly in a way I yeah, was not exactly. aware of. But we have conversational flow. So all yes. of which is to say, this is going to be fun. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I had a really hard time about, and this was years ago, maybe even the last time you were here for Telegraph Avenue, I looked this up. And we are exactly the same age. And I was really distressed by that. Um, <laughs> Why? Because you were such a big deal to me when I was a child. Uh, it was really imperative to me that to think that you were older because you hit so young. Mm -hmm. And you were you were like a teen idol. You know, you were Yeah, the like person. Bobby Sherman kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But when I was not in graduate school, but just out of graduate school and kind of getting started on my own dreams and still a waitress, you mm -hmm. published Mysteries of Pittsburgh, which is such a fantastic book. And, and I have all of these questions like, do people still come up to you and say, oh, Mysteries of Pittsburgh, that's my favorite? Mm -hmm. Yes, they do. And does that just depress the hell out of you? No, people? not at all. Okay. Mm -mm. Have you ever read it again? Not all the way through. Mm -hmm. No, not since probably 19... 89. So even... I'm, I mean, a, I'm afraid to. Oh, I've never read any of mine. No, I mean, it's just... I try to explain this to people. It's... It never... We, we've all had the experience, I'm sure, of coming across something that we wrote when we were 16 or 17 or 18, even if it's just a letter that you find that you wrote home from college to your parents and you find it and it's so humiliating and, and you're you, so pretentious and so pretentious yeah. and you you just feel such shame at, over having been the person who thought this was an appropriate thing to say to one's mother or you know lecturing <laughs> your mother about you know Foucault or whatever <laughs> and um and it's just that but that for me that experience it's like on a, a slider like it never it's, uh, stuff that I've written even much more recently than when I was a pretentious adolescent. I still can't enjoy reading it most of the time because all I see are the things where I feel like I, you know, I'll be honest, what, what mostly, what I notice when I do go back and look at stuff I've written are the places that people suggested I cut that I didn't listen to them. And I thought I was right and I go back and look and say, oh, this actually should have been cut. <laughs> That's really interesting. You know, I've had that experience with short pieces, with mm -hmm. essays, mm -hmm. where the piece is cut, I thought, for space. Right. Um, and then when I put together a collection of essays and I went back and had my original and then the published copy mm -hmm. that was a thousand words shorter, mm -hmm. and it was... And you're like, oh, I see. Oh, actually, yeah, that's why they get those checks mm -hmm. being editors, because they know what to take out. Mm -hmm. But I really want to talk about the experience of Mysteries of Pittsburgh. Sure. Because I didn't know you then, and we've never talked about mm -hmm. that. But how troubling and strange and fabulous that must have been to be so famous at 25 and to write such a good book that everybody took you so seriously and everybody in graduate schools all over the country were <laughs> Michael. I didn't know um, that. Thank God there was no internet then. You know what I mean? Oh, and this yeah. is, we're talking about 1988. So if I, there was so much of it, of of whatever the response to that was at the time, I was unaware, I am sure, of 98% of it because I had no access to it. But, but, but the, this, the thing that I feel the most looking back is that I completely took it for granted. And not because I thought it was my due, but because I didn't know how 
odd it was, or I didn't realize that the was how exceptional it was. And, and maybe that's partly because at the time it seemed a little less exceptional because that was the tail end of the Brett Easton Ellis, um, uh, Jay McInerney, Tama Janowitz, the Brat Pack they were called. It was sort of, it was something that did happen to younger yes. writers. So I thought, oh, well, it's my turn and it'll be somebody else's turn after me. And it actually turned out the, the, that moment kind of ended not long after where the young first time novelists were getting. And you didn't have any of the trash that was connected to those other people. You were not, I mean, if, if you were doing a lot of Coke at Studio 54, you were being very no, discreet about no, it. No, no, uh, I was you, drinking a lot of Coke. <laughs> <laughs> that's but, that was it. The but you know, like the, it, that's part of the story. That it seems that everyone else who had early success also they, crashed they and burned. They fed it in a way too, though. They made the scene and, mm -hmm. and appeared, and their picture was frequently in Vanity Fair, right? Exactly. Things like that. And I was to I, I got married to my first wife just before. Mysteries of Pittsburgh was published. So I was already like a married man, and we moved up to um, uh, near Seattle, Vashon Island in Puget Sound. So I lived on this island, and, and, and you know, how much of that was um, something I did that then protected me from the pitfalls, or something that I did because I didn't, because I'm just not the kind of person that would, would want to be out there at Studio 54. Doing coke. It's a long way from those islands yes, off the I mean, coast I of went Seattle. Away and I kind of right. hid myself from it. And I think that was, I mean, I'm, I don't, I think most people who become writers, when you, when you decide you want to be a writer, what you're really thinking is, oh, good, I'll get to spend a whole lot of time by myself right. in a room <laughs> playing with my toys. Right. And that's what I like to do. And if, if at that moment, you know, the, the angel of, of, publication appeared to you and said, okay, you're going to get, get to be a writer and get your books published and you're going to go out on the road and talk to big audiences and, and meet lots of people and get to go to a lot of parties and hang out with strangers that you don't know and take drugs with them and so on. I, you know, I would have said, hmm, architecture is also interesting. <laughs> and it, you get to play with building toys. You know, I mean, I yeah. think it's not, it's the last thing I ever wanted was to, to be known or to be, have a public face. I want, it's a private activity. It's an intensely private activity. So this is one of my all-time favorite questions. If you had it to do over again, would you be Elena Ferrante? If you could rewrite your history and say that you had a secret identity and no one had any idea who you were. In, in principle, that sounds good. But I feel, and, and it was proven in practice with her, but in, in practice, I feel like you're asking for it in a way, like you're, you're, that this person went out there and tracked her, her down and figured out who she really was. And I feel like it, to, to, in practice, to try to be that kind of anonymous is asking to have your privacy violated in a way that it might not be if you didn't try to be so private and personal. But in theory, that sounds kind of good. Well, and I think that Pinchon, I'm, you want to talk about Pinchon in your life? Because that's really interesting. Uh huh. Yeah, he's, um, he's done it pretty well, and, but he didn't try to hide his exactly. name. You know, he, right. he, everyone sort of, you, if you want to, you can find Thomas Pynchon. If you, if you poke around and you read what's been written about him, and you know, for a while he has kids and, or a son, and that kid was in school in New York City. So you, there are ways you could sort of figure out how you might sit in the right cafe or, or restaurant and have a chance of seeing him. I know people um, who did stuff like that or tried to catch a glimpse of him. It could be done. But um, uh, yeah, he's kind of done it the right way, if that's your goal. It just, I don't know. It's amazing that he seems to have known from such an early point in his life that that is how he wanted it. Because yeah. by the time I might have gotten to a point where exactly. I thought, you know what would be the right way to do this? It was too late. That's and, right. You were already on the train. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't seem like Mysteries of Pittsburgh messed you up. It, oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> it, um, it, you know, I think it was actually... 
uh, on the whole, it was a, a, obviously a positive experience, and I wouldn't have wanted it to happen differently. But it did make it hard for me in various ways thereafter. So that, um, for example, one of my very closest friendships, which was formed in graduate school at Irvine when the two of us were both just graduate students, definitely ended because eventually, not on the day Mysteries of Pittsburgh was published, but it was, there was a certain competitive element that just didn't seem to weather that experience, and that's still a painful loss to me all these years later. And um, uh, I stuck with, I signed a contract for that, for the next book, and I took an advance, and I worked on that novel for five and a half years, long past the point where I knew that it was, I should have abandoned it. And if I hadn't taken quite so much money, perhaps, and, but also even more than that, if I just didn't feel like, oh, I really have to follow that one up in some way that's going to be, seem to make it seem to have been, um, to be worthy of all the expectations right. that seem to be generated, um, I probably also would have given it up sooner. And, and um, it was a really painful experience to just for that five and a half years. And it's a horrible thing that I think a, a lot of writers experience where you're working on the project for a really long time. And, and then there are those people that you in your family or your friend group that you see like at Thanksgiving or on some annual occasion, right. and you haven't seen them since the last one, and they're like, still working on that book? <laughs> You're working on last Thanksgiving and two Thanksgivings ago? And, and that humiliation of saying, yes, I'm still working on it. Um, you know, and I, so it, it skewed things in various ways, but not, obviously, it was a, I, I, I survived, I came through it. And I, I think it is ultimately, um, it's always just about just keep writing and just keep. I gave up that book, but and immediately started work on what became Wonder Boys, and just I think writing Wonder Boys and sort of just creating this almost like a voodoo doll of just putting all the worst possible consequences of early success and. Um, being stuck working on a book for a really long time and, and allowing your life to go completely out of control in the way that um, I could have done and somehow managed not to, um, just by putting all that into Grady Trip and, and yeah. putting that out there in the form of a book, I think that was ultimately sort of my, my, my therapy or restoration. And I really do feel that that book saved me. Like when people ask me, what's your favorite of all of your books, I always say Wonder Boys. And it's because, I mean, I, I think it's an okay book, but it's just because writing it saved me. It saved my writing. It made me, it, re, it restored my confidence in myself that I actually could finish something that I had started. And, um, Didn't so, you write it freaky fast? Too? Yeah, seven months for a first draft. And then about a year and a half for the whole thing. And um, yeah, it just was like, thank God, I still actually do know how to do this. But I, I did it in a way by retreating, because the book that I had been working on was, in a way, nothing like Cavalier and Clay, except that it was really big, and it took place over multiple continents, and um, had multiple points of view, and, um, and I was not able to finish it. And then I, with Wonder Boys, I kind of went back, and I went back to Pittsburgh. and. Mysteries of Pittsburgh takes place over one summer, and I went even smaller with Wonder Boys. It's one weekend, you know, and, and, it's, and I had been writing in the third person. I went back to the first person. I went back to all the things I already knew. I could do Pittsburgh. I could do first person. I could do... Right. And, and just to sort of reestablish that trust in myself and say, okay, let's just start again, and here's Wonder Boys. And then I was able to go on after that. And yet the books don't feel in any way similar. Wonder Boys and Mysteries of Pittsburgh. Yeah. Not, not really. I mean, no. even, even though you're setting all of those no. things up, I'm no. thinking, oh, yeah. No, because Wonder Boys has a much more wised up tone, more of a kind of, um, not jaded exactly, but it's just a slightly jaundiced view of things that A little the world weary. Yeah, a little world weary, which is totally an affectation on my on my part. Um, yeah, you don't strike me as so world weary. Yeah, no, no. I was, <laughs> I was channeling this professor of mine that I'd had at um, the University of Pittsburgh. And I, I can say this now, for a long time I used to try to, I thought for his sake, hide the fact that I had based the character of Grady Tripp on my beloved um, professor at the University of Pittsburgh, Chuck Kinder. Um, and 
I modeled Grady in a lot of ways on Chuck. Um, I, there were elements of some other teachers I'd had over the years, but I didn't want to say so because I just, I don't know, he's kind of a messed up character. And of course, Chuck himself is not messed up at all. So, um, uh, and then at some point, I met someone who had come through the undergraduate writing program at Pitt and sometime in the early 2000s. and. Um, said that she'd been in Chuck's modern novel class, and he teaches Wonder Boys and tells everybody it's him. <laughs> so you hadn't been in touch with him? No, I hadn't been. Maybe, like, this is pre-email era, you know? I, like, I hadn't, yeah. when I'd been to Pittsburgh, whatever reason, maybe I think I did see him one time, but bef maybe before Wonder Boys came out or something. So, yeah, and I had no idea. And, and then when I heard that, I just was like, okay. <laughs> I'm telling everybody. <laughs> He's telling everybody. Is writing a novel for you in a way of seeing how life could have played out, like the different scenarios? Very much so. And with this new book in particular, and yeah. you know, it's a, um, it's, in, it's a novel in the form of a memoir. And Boy, uh, I want to talk about this. All right, well, yeah, go let's go. It. So the memoir is... Um, uh, uh, you know, it's a narrator writing about his grandfather, and the narrator definitely bears resemblance to me, and deliberately so, and I'm trying to create this. I, I wanted it to read like a real memoir. It, so the narrator seems to be me, therefore the grandfather must be my grandfather. Of course, he's not. He's a fictional character. But this, what I came to realize only really when the book was done was that it was a, it, it's much more autobiographical than it is a memoir of my grandfather, but it's an autobiographical portrait of myself. But in the grandfather, and to answer your question, like it as a kind of how things might have been, mm -hmm. because the grandfather, unlike me, um, is a bad boy. And when he was young, he didn't care about him. This is growing up in Philadelphia to immigrant parents who had very high expectations of their children, and he never tried to fulfill those expectations. And he, um, he was always in trouble and getting in fights and um, running away and being lost. And, um, and there's the younger brother who is the one who becomes a rabbi and kind of fulfills all, briefly fulfills all of very this. Very briefly. Yes, yeah. before becoming a pool hustler. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and even though the grandfather over time evolves into someone with really, really strong, almost rigid kind of moral codes of behavior, and he believes in there are certain things you know a man must do, and he tries to do those things, but it's always um, um, it's a struggle for him to overcome his natural tendency towards disruption and he has violent tendencies and he's a he's he you know the sight of something built up is always going to inspire some urge in him to knock it down and um i was always a good boy and from my earliest childhood always tried to please my parents please my teachers do well in school meet all the marks that were set and but there's a Bad. There's a bad boy inside me that that never really got to come out. The one that would think about doing the thing I wasn't supposed to do, but then never did it. And in part, in creating the character of this grandfather, I think without meaning to, I I sort of try, I got to live a life of someone whose um, struggle is like my struggle is always just to. Um, to try to do what was right. And I feel like with the grandfather, it's more of a struggle not to do what's wrong. Yeah. And um, so in that sense, I do, I think I was sort of reimagining my own life by imagining the life of this grandfather. Do you care if anybody talks about this in terms of memoir or autobiography or if they get it or if they don't? Um, no, I, mean, I don't care. I tried to make it clear, you know, and I tried to right. give lots of notice and warnings without just like coming right out and saying it. I tried to, so, you know, it's labeled a novel on the cover and on the title page, and there's an author's note where, I mean, I don't say author's note, this is a novel and I made all this shit up, but, <laughs> but I say that essentially in a more artful, sort of deliberately evasive way as if I were actually a memoirist, because in my mind, this author's note is written by the memoirist. And he's defending the license he's taken with 
this supposedly real life material. So I get it, it's not like totally explicit, but then in the end, in the acknowledgements, I, I try to signal like one last time, if you got this far and you're reading these acknowledgements, <laughs> it says like, it's, there's a list of people, all these named people, the librarian at the CIA library in Langley and the librarian at the, um, at the uh, NASA Goddard Space Center Library and all these people, and, and I listen, this person, this person, this person, et cetera, would have been helpful if they existed. <laughs> so, you know, I tried to use truth and labeling to a degree, but... Um, but you're getting a boost off of our false expectations. Yes, I mean, I, you're not calling the narrator Bill. You're calling no, the narrator Exactly, Mike. and that's because I got a boost as a writer from mm -hmm. playing it that mm -hmm. way, and it gave me the opportunity to... Um, I felt so completely immersed in the story of my grandfather and my grandmother that they, they became my grandfather and my grandmother to me in a way that was, I still find surprising and almost a little disturbing. And so like they're referred to as my grandmother and my grandfather. They're never referred to by name. And some uh, people have drawn attention to that in some of the reviews and the thing, and I realize that at some point I'm writing and think, well, okay, these people have names, presumably. So what should I do about that? Now I kept, I had referred to them initially just as my grandmother and grandfather because when you read memoirs, people are talking about their parents or grandparents, that's right. what they say. They say like, you know, uh, Tina Sinatra's, I read Tina Sinatra's memoir of her father because I was working on a Frank Sinatra movie project for a while and she calls him daddy. Daddy did this, daddy said that. So that's why I was doing it, it was, um, to be Plausible. more like Tina Sinatra? Yes. yes, to be more like, I mean, that's my goal generally in life, is to be more like Tina Sinatra, who looks fabulous. I just want to say she's 72 and you would never know it. Um, but, uh, but then, so I'm thinking, okay, well, what are their names? I couldn't say their names were, in, as in the case of my actual maternal grandparents, Ernest and Nettie Cohen, because I knew Ernest and Nettie Cohen. Right. This is not them. It's weird. It would be weird to call them <laughs> Ernest and Nettie Cohen. Those were real people, and they did totally different things with their lives. And, and in particular, my grandmother, Nettie, was nothing, has no resemblance whatsoever to the grandmother in the book. So that felt weird. That would be wrong. But then it, I thought, okay, well, um, I could make up some names for them. And, but I, when I did that, I felt that's totally wrong because these are my grandparents. Right. I mean, those weren't my how they're like a they're like a ghost set. They're like a third set of grandparents. Exactly. They're phantom grandparents and they I felt about them I know way more about them than I knew about any of my actual grandparents. <laughs> um, and in, I mean in a way that's part of the motivation for writing a book is when you and when you know you get to that age j typically just when you get to the age where you're starting to really want to know about the real people that your grandparents were is the age where you, you that where you've lost them, when you know they. Y y y I feel like you have to be generally in your mid twenties before it occurs to you that your grandfather and grandmother were human beings who had sex and and had professional failures at work and 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 where you think you realize like I cannot actually imagine what was the content of the conversation they had at the dinner table in 1934. And, and instead of being able to say what was the content of your dinner table conversation, you, there's nobody you can ask anymore. Isn't that true of parents as well? Isn't yes. the same point when you yes you don't know that about your parents either? I think you. I think we are. We do over time, especially start to make our parents into caricatures of themselves when through the way we talk about them to other people, and we tend to select by which I mean, you know, you select a few representative traits and you let those traits stand in for the whole. And at some point with your parents, you know that's what you're doing, and then I think over time you start to forget that that's what you did and that the caricature becomes the representation. Um, I think even so, it's even more. You're, you're, you start out that way with your grandparents. And in fact, you're sort of encouraged by the parents who have made them into car caricatures. You're encouraged to just, so that grandpa from the beginning is, you know, wears 
socks with sandals and drives 35 miles per hour on the right-hand line, lane, the freeway all the time. And like my, when my wife talks about her grandmother, she, you know, she would always talk about how her grandmother always watched the Weather Channel in a state of panic, perpetual like alertness. And anytime there was like when we lived in LA, like if there were wildfires anywhere in the state of California, even way up by the Oregon border, she's like, "Are you okay?" She would call us up, you know. And like that becomes you, 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 you almost. And probably grandparents are complicit in this to a degree too, because it would be weird if grandparents went around sharing their innermost thoughts and feelings with their grandchildren. It would certainly be unconventional, um, and like talking about their sex lives and so on. So, but um, there does come a point where I feel like you wish you knew more. You wish, and sometimes you wish you knew a lot more, and and there's no way to find out. And this was brought home to me really recently and in a way that's very much in keeping with things that happen in Moonglow because there's a lot in Moonglow with photographs and sort of mysterious photographs whose either the context for the photo is missing or the photo is missing and there's only right. context. Right. And um, uh, while I was working on the book, almost done with it, my mom came by with some a box of stuff she was clearing out, her storage space in her building, and she um, brought this photo album of a bunch of old family photos. Now, not only was there that common and, and really tragic experience where we're looking through some really old photos and neither of us has any idea who any of the people in these photos are, or else you're like, okay, that's Aunt Julia, but I don't know who that guy is, and I don't know who that is, and what's with, I didn't know they had a car like that, and all that kind of stuff. Right. We had that experience, and then there's this picture of my grandmother, Nettie Cohen, who was um, just a very traditional Jewish s suburban homemaker of the 1950s and 60s. By the time I knew her, she was, she was a really good cook. She kept her house very clean, and she was quiet and didn't ever say contribute much to dinner table conversation and, and really was not a strong presence except, I mean, she was warm and affectionate toward me and I knew she loved me and I loved her the way you're supposed to love your grandmother, but um, I don't know anything about her. Nothing. Like How I, I old were you when she died? Uh, 23. And there's this picture of her, this big photo like this big, in, 19, in the 1920s and probably the late 20s in Philadelphia and she's on the street and she has a, like an Amelia Earhart haircut, really short, a boy's haircut and she's wearing knickers and socks and masculine shoes and she has a big bulky cardigan sweater with a cowl neck and, and a man's shirt underneath. She's dressed like a man, like a boy, like a youth of the time with her short hair. And she has a huge smile on her face, and she's just radiant smile looking up at the camera. And I had, uh, you know, I, my mom and I are looking at this. I said, is that, like, is this a costume? Is this, a, like, she dressing up as a boy for this day? And then, we, and then it seemed like, well, the haircut's pretty a radical step for the time. Like, you wouldn't just get your hair cut like that for a, for a costume. Right. So, like, did she always dress this way? Was this her thing? Is this something girls were all doing then? Or what is the story of this grinning, super happy, radiant, very butch looking woman who's my grandmother, the same woman I remember wearing those weird matching polyester, like, like orange polyester pants with a white and orange polyester sack top kind of thing, you know? Like that was big for women in the 70s of a certain age. Um, and there's nobody to ask, nobody. There's no one, my mom does not know the answer, and there's nobody left that does. And it's that sort of sense of mystery and, and that realization that there's so much unknown about the people that produced you uh, that was a kind of open invitation in this book to me to just go in there and make it all up, in a sense, to invent the grandparents that I, I didn't ever really get to know. Have you written this down? This is so interesting, this explanation, which no. I think would apply to anyone. I think so, too. About how we think about people, essay time. OK, all right. Uh, yeah, there's Good. your assignment. All right, thank you. I'll get on um, it. <laughs> really? I mean, that's. No, I mean, and if your grandparents happen to still be alive, embarrass them and yourself. 
and ask them this stuff. Like, I mean, why not? Ask them, try to think of the things that you really want to know and ask them, I wish I had now. And, and, and the worst thing that would have happened was they would have evaded the question in some way and I'd be no worse off and neither would they. How old were you when you lost your last grandparent? Um, it was my grandfather and he died in 1989. So he lived long enough to see the mysteries of Pittsburgh. See the mysteries of Pittsburgh. Yeah, and yeah. he is very proud and he is very um, enthusiastic. And I remember I still have this card he sent me um, to congratulate me. And it was a photo card of um, a picture of the Empire State Building's pinnacle with the Goodyear blimp um, sort of approaching it. So it looked like it was tied up in the way that blimps were, or dirigibles were meant to be originally, supposedly. And, um, and the opening of Mysteries of Pittsburgh has this invocation of the image of this Art Deco building with a dirigible tied up to it. And he, he wrote, he like quoted that passage and he said, this isn't quite that, but um, I thought you would enjoy it. And congratulations on the book. So, you know, that was, he, he, he definitely took pleasure in that. So, I'm sure this is not an important point, but I really wondered about it. Why is the grandfather in the book not the biological grandfather of the narrator? Because... And, and explain that setup to them sure. so they know what I'm talking about. Um, so, in the book, my mother is um, the daughter of a, um, a French Jewish woman who, immig uh, who immigrated to the United States after World War II and brought her with her when she was four years old. Um, and then shortly thereafter meets the grandfather at a, at a synagogue Monte Carlo night. Um, and he is not, it's really love at first sight for him and he's not troubled by the fact that she has a four-year-old daughter. Um, and a mysterious history that, um, that is really never elucidated for him in his lifetime, even though, and that's partly by choice on his part. He has an opportunity to find out the truth and he, he steps away from it. But um, so it was, um, it was partly, I tried to keep the dates as much the same as real life dates in my right. life. Right. For my, just for my own convenience. So that, I, okay, I was born in 1963, so my narrator was born in 1963, and my mother was born in 1942, so I'm gonna have this mother also be born in 1942, just so I don't have to do yeah. that kind of, I know you like math, um, but I don't, and just <laughs> having to make all new sets of calculations and stuff. So, but having done that, then I have this woman who was born in 1942, but her mother doesn't come to America till 1942. Seven. So, uh, therefore, she was born over there. Therefore, the grandfather, who is American, has to be her stepfather. It was a. It was logic that. It was circumstance that was forced on me by the logic of the numbers. But as soon as I, and it wasn't there initially. As soon as I made that change, though, it seems so right for the character of of the grandfather because, like I said, he's always, he's. He, it seemed like the perfect test he would set himself, and he's the kind of person who was constantly setting himself tests to prove that he could be a good father to someone who's not his biological child. That, and at the same time, even more, it's a form of his proving his love for, for this woman, that he's going to show her just how much he loves her. He loves her so much that he this issue that she has his child is not only not a problem for him, but he's going to be a good father to her. And um, so it's almost like a love offering of his, but in a very typical form in that it's all about like being a good breadwinner, you know, supporting her, uh, educating her and all the things. It's not necessarily about being like a good father the way we, we might define it nowadays. But it never seems to come up for the narrator at all, that, that he's interviewing his grandfather to mm -hmm. get the story of his grandfather's life, and it's, it's not nice. actually his grandfather. Right. Yes. Um, well, it comes up, there's little sly kind of references to it, or like the grandfather makes a few little, not so much about his grandson, but when he's talking about the, 
his daughter, his adopted daughter, and he'll say things like, she gets that from me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, so he's, he's, he makes light of it in a way. But no, I think for the, um, I don't know, I just imagine that if it, it wouldn't matter to the, if, if you're born into a world where this is your right. grandfather, no. this is your grandfather, yeah. it just didn't, it felt like it was natural. Talk about covering such a big space of time and the grandfather really has several different lives over the course of the novel. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like you were picking out these points with great care or that you just needed to touch in different moments? I mean, I, because having just written a book in which I'm scanning 50 mm -hmm. years and yeah. the characters are developing over time, I sort of feel like, yeah, I, I, I could be telling this. You know, it could be the snake mm -hmm. eating the pet. Right. Um, but it could also have been about the flooding of a miniature golf course next door. Like, uh -huh. it, right. Like, where, like, wh how it, did those how moments... How much does it matter what the moment is, or is it just that you're really focusing on the character and how they're responding to the action? You know, in a weird way, it's neither. And this book had some very mysterious... Its birth was very mysterious to me. It was a mysterious process in that I was um, planning to write a novel to follow Telegraph Avenue. I thought I knew what that novel was going to be. I had been doing a lot of reading and research for it and thinking about it. Um, and the day came when I thought, okay, you know, starting, going to start the new book. I didn't have it. I wasn't ready to start writing, but I was going to sit, go out and sit down and just make notes and say, here's what I think this book's going to be about, which is it's usually a typical starting place for me. It's sort of a, almost like a pitch letter to myself. Like, mm -hmm. here's, I think these characters, I have this setting, and it's going to go here, and it's going to be about that. Um, and a lot of it would occur, will just occur to me as I'm writing it. Right. But, that's part of the process. So I went out to start to do that. And I had just read um, Train Dreams by Dennis Johnson, which I just love, love. that book so much. Yeah. I've read it about four times now. It's so slender. You can read it twice in one day. And Why didn't it win the Pulitzer? I, that was weird, wasn't it? I Somebody told me it just was because it had been published yeah. in its entirety previously. But that seems Such like a, a lame reason not to give a brilliant book an important price that he deserved. Anyway, um, he has this little thing. I had just finished it, maybe the day before. So, and in that book, he has this incident where the then, by then, an old man, the main character, maybe his name's, I can't remember, any Robert, I think. He, um, he lives in this tiny town up in the north, way up in like eastern Washington or Idaho, up by the Canadian border. And it's in the 1950s, and so he's quite old by now. And he goes into town and a train has stopped at the depot in town because it's broken down or something. I don't, I don't know what happens with trains, but some bad thing happened with the train. And it stopped and, it, and Elvis Presley is on the train. And he's at the peak of his first fame. And, um, uh, and everyone's kind of come down to try to catch a glimpse of him. And you have this old man that you've encountered as sort of this just an anonymous figure in the history of the West who works in logging camps and as a bridge builder and so on, as a road crew kind of guy, and has had all this tragedy and sorrow, and it's in a very kind of dark Dennis Johnson West kind of way. And then he's, this life is intersecting with this big, shiny piece of American pop culture history and I'm, it just I love that moment I've always from like I you know I came of age with books like Ragtime and um, Max Apple's early stories mm -hmm. where real life history and real life historical figures interact with fictional characters and and this was a moment like that and it was a very beautiful moment and so I sat down to work and I and I just thought I was doing this other book and I started thinking about this story I remembered hearing about my grandfather's uncle I'm sorry, my great uncle, my grandfather's brother, having been fired from his job um, as a salesman in New York City to make room on the payroll for Alger Hiss after Alger Hiss got out of prison uh, for perjury, um, the famous supposed uh, communist spy. And, um, and that was the same kind of thing of this sort of anonymous toiler losing his job and coming, his life intersecting with this big piece of American history. And I just started to write that and I switched uh, grand uncle to grandfather and, 
and I was writing the incident that opens the book with, with this firing and the, and the grandfather's violent response to being fired to make room for Alger Hiss. And I wrote for a couple of days, and then on the third day, I went out to work, and I just, I, I was going to keep going. And I suddenly thought, OK, there's going to be a s snake. There's a, I'm going to do part in a retirement community in Florida, and there's going to be the whole thing. There's going to be a World War II part. I'm going to show him in Europe tracking uh, Nazi scientists, because I had been reading about that, I think. And I'm going to also show him like getting ready to go off to war. And I'm going to show all the time streams just were there uh, by the third day. And I just quickly jotted them all down so I wouldn't forget. And, and so I don't know how the choice really did get made. It was just this, it was, you know, I opened the microwave and the burrito was, <laughs> it was ready. It was cooked. It was cooked, yeah. Um, I, have, I just have a couple more questions that I really want to get to. Um, I find that questions about work habits are the most boring, and yet, gosh, your work habits are so strange and interesting <laughs> to me. So I think they probably would love to hear about them. Well, I, I wear a Cookie Monster costume. <laughs> I don't think that's that weird. Um... I work at night. I work, I start at 10 or 11, and I work, it used to be only five days a week. I used to take weekends off, and I don't anymore. So I work almost every night now from um, 10 or 11 till about 4 or 5 in the morning. Um, <laughs> you know, it's quiet. It's, there's nothing else to do. I mean, when there was no internet, it was even, there was even less to do. Um, now, you know, the internet never closes, but still you're not getting emails at that hour, and um, uh, it feels as if, I was talking at the beginning about that wanting to be alone in your room to play with your toys, and you, you just are the most alone in the middle of the night. The solitude is, is palpable, and I like that. Um, and it just seems to be my natural time period, and in fact, it's getting later. Like, the reason I'm staying up so late is that um, I can write maybe 400 words from between, say, 10 and 3, and then between 3 and 5.30, I might write 1,100 words more. It just, the later I stay up, the easier the writing becomes. And I've tried so many times to switch to a saner, more normal schedule. And you know, I, we have four kids, and when that's they, my next question. When they, when they were little, especially missing out on the morning was always painful to me. And, and even once they start school, in particular, because they're chipper in the morning, and I like to make breakfast. I'm the cook in the house, and like to know that you gave them a good breakfast, and and they're all. Blab, you know, blabbing and talking and stuff. That's a really nice time of day, and I like being there for it. Um, but then when they left, I couldn't work. I just, I would just sit and feel stuck and not. I just don't feel like writing so early in the morning. It doesn't work, even though I like to get up early. So you I, like to get up early because you're already up. exactly. <laughs> no, but however, I'll say when I'm working late and it's like we go to Maine in the summertime, and in the summer in Maine it starts to get light. Well, you hear the first birds starting to tweet about 4 o'clock in the morning. And so I'll be working, and I hear the birds, and I have this feeling like, oh, fuck. Sorry. <laughs> the birds are tweeting. I'm really, it's late. Like, I've been, and, and then, you know, I'll look, oh, my God, OK. But I still keep going. And then when I finish work, and maybe even if I try to rush it, and it's 4.30 or quarter five, the sun's coming up. And I don't, I feel this weird sense of moral despair of. <laughs> As if I had stayed up all night drinking and carousing and wasting my life, I have that same, not that I ever really did a whole lot of that even when I was young, but that same sense you of. You have the walk of shame like, yes, down the hall. Yes, like, oh man, it's <laughs> daytime and I've been up all night and what's wrong with me? Um, I don't know why. It's not like I enjoy that part of it, the experience. I always feel like I have to, I will actually sometimes just like, rush to bed, to, just so I technically I'm getting in bed before it's actually light out. Just, I don't know why, like I don't, nobody cares but me. But, um, but there's something, I have this, I was telling you about it earlier, like my son, when my son is now in college, was a senior in high school, I was working on a project and staying up really late for about a couple weeks. And there were a couple times when I, my studio was behind the house 
in Berkeley, and I was coming, finishing up and walking towards the house, and it's all dark, and then the light would come on in the kitchen, and I would see my son in the house coming into the kitchen, and he would see me coming up the back steps, and he would look at me through the window and just go. <laughs> you know, like, you're not living your life properly, Dad. Like, <laughs> what's wrong with you? And, um, and, I, uh, I ha and that actually just fed that same thing I, I always have, but I just don't know how else to do it. I love, when I'm working, I love the feeling of being all by myself in the middle of the night. It's pleasurable. You have a famously happy marriage and four kids, and how, how does that impact work? And people, as somebody who doesn't have kids, people always want to ask me, well, what's, you know, why did you not have mm -hmm. kids, and how does that impact mm -hmm. your work? I always think, in fact, anything. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But, but how, how would you be different as a writer if you didn't have well, kids? Well, I probably would have, have, probably have at least one, maybe two more short story collections <laughs> than I do. I mean, there, if you graph it. the opposite. I mean, I'm thinking just the opposite. I'm thinking you got the pedal to the metal because you've got all these kids and they're expensive. Well, and you, you know. Well, yeah, right, so who would write build short an stories? Empire, exactly. Right. You, <laughs> nobody gets rich writing short stories. I mean, that's, I think, like, if you graphed my short Story production, and then correlated it to my child production. You, I mean, it would be direct yeah. correlation. Like my, my, the more children we had, the fewer short stories I wrote until we had four sh children, and then I haven't written. I think I've written two short stories in the past twelve years or something like that. So, I mean, I used to. I'm not. I'm a natural novelist in terms. I love short stories. I love to read them, and I, and it was very important to me to write them too. But. I would do it between novel writing, either when I needed a break or when I was finished or something between drafts. Um, I used to do it in the cracks, and there just aren't any more cracks. And it, or if there is, if I am going to take on other work, it has to pay, has to be screenwriting or, or something to pay okay, the bills. Okay, so talk about film and your relationship to Hollywood and that whole thing. Well, I tried for a really long time to protect myself. I mean, everyone knows what happens to writers in Hollywood, and F. Scott Fitzgerald is not just the you know classic example, but still quite viable, um, you know, cautionary tale. Um, and it's obvious to see what went wrong with F. Scott Fitzgerald when you look back. Um, um, he cared too much, right? He he really he he was interested in movies, and he really wanted to write good movies and. They had him over. Was that, that's how they had him over a barrel. Like, as soon as you are invested in it emotionally, they, it, they, that's when that's when they have you completely where they want you. And so I tried, having been warned in various ways. I, I take a moment to tell a funny story that Robert Stone told me um, when I I didn't know him very well, but I met him um, in the early '90s in Key West, Florida, where he spent a lot of time. And he was a lovely, charming, wonderful man, very kind to me. And he, I hadn't really done any screenwriting work yet. And he said, if you ever, you know, you'll probably want to get into it. I'm just going to warn you. And here's my story. Writing a writer in Hollywood is like being, you're, a limousine comes and picks you up. And it takes you to a place. And the door opens. And there's a man standing there with a giant uh, submarine sandwich. You know, what do they call them in Nashville? Hoagies, grinders, heroes, subs. subs. So, and it's the most beautiful home-baked loaf of bread, and it's got every kind of Italian meat of every salamis and hams and, and the most beautiful cheeses and antipastos, and it's the most gorgeous sandwich you've ever seen. And they, the man says, this sandwich is for you. And you take the sandwich and you look and you notice just right in the middle of the sandwich, right there, there's a little tiny piece of shit. <laughs> I'm quoting Robert Stone so I can say that. And you say to yourself, maybe I can just eat around that. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, that, that's, it's so accurate because you're, you keep getting... I tried so hard, and, and but what I realized was my ability to not care and not be invested and just be doing it for the money, which is the only way to protect yourself, is if you don't care and you're only doing it for the money. But that, that uh, my uh, ability to do that diminished as my 
ability as a screenwriter increased. So the better I got at screenwriting technically, the more I understood it and how to do it and, and what was the difference between good screenwriting and bad screenwriting or ineffective and effective screenwriting, the more I mastered the task, the more I cared about what I was doing. And the more I cared about what I was doing, the more I was just right in there, cross hairs and for, you know, set up for heartbreak. Um, so, but I still keep doing because it, 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 partly because it pays well and partly because we get our health insurance from the Writers Guild of America and now we're going to need it more than ever. Um, and uh, so I just keep going back um, to that same place. And I've had, I've actually had in some ways the worst possible kind of, I thought the worst thing that could happen to you was that they would put, make, make you jump through all these hoops and have you do all these rewrites, making it progressively stupider and stupider, um, and then it wouldn't get made. Like I thought, and that's happened to me many times. And I thought that's, and, it, and the more you care about it, the worse that feels. First making it stupider feels terrible, and then having it not get made feels bad. But I actually had the experience of having something that I was very invested in, that I was quite proud of, that I worked very hard on, get made, and then become one of the most famous flops in the history of cinema, which is the movie John Carter um, that came out from Disney a couple years ago as an adaptation of Edgar Rice Burroughs' John Carter of Mars series. And I loved working on that project, and I love working with the people, and I feel like the director and everyone else involved did a great job, and then the movie was just this is now like proverbial. It's up there with Ishtar and, and you know, uh, wow. Heaven's Gate. It didn't destroy the studio. So but it, it tried. But it tried, yeah. <laughs> so, and, that, and I remember reading this about six months before when I was still feeling like this is going to be so incredible. It's going to be so great. And the guy who wrote a movie, a most recent movie adaptation of Conan, the Barbarian film, he wrote this really just poignant and pathetic essay about how he loved the Conan stories as a kid, and he couldn't believe he got hired to do this project, and that he loved working with the director, and he loved working on that thing, and then it was this horrible, colossal failure and disappointment. It was a very sort of soul-searching essay, and I remember reading it and desperately wanting to feel smug toward it, and instead just feeling like, oh my god, <laughs> that's going to happen to me. I love the John Carter books as a kid. This is everything about this. And then I was like, no, 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 don't, don't go there. It's going to be fine. <laughs> And then about two weeks before the movie came out, we just—it's just, we started hearing that you know the drum beats were unmistakable. It was, this is shaping up to be a total turkey, and and I was in the same boat as the poor Conan guy. Do you feel like it's hours and weeks and months and years of your life thrown away of of writing all of this writing that comes to nothing? Sometimes, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, there are many. <laughs> I try not to look at it though. I try to look on you know, the bright side. I worked for a long time on this Frank Sinatra movie I alluded to. Um, where it was for Marty, Martin Scorsese to direct. Like, okay, Martin Scorsese, Frank Sinatra. What's I'm there, right? Totally. I'm gonna, Tina? I, and Tina, yeah, yeah. I got to meet Tina and spend some time with Tina. Um, and I, I love Frank Sinatra anyway. I love his music. I was. It was, a, if nothing else, I was getting paid to listen to lots of Frank Sinatra recordings and read biographies of Frank Sinatra and immerse myself in, in the world of Frank Sinatra. And I wrote a script for it, and, um, and I worked really hard, and I jumped through several hoops, but it wasn't to make it dumber. It actually got better with the notes I was getting, and it ended up being, I think it's a really good script. It would really be good, but it just didn't um, please the people it needed to please to get the check written to make the movie. And um, I mean, I, I really, between the staying up, that's the project I was working on when I was staying up till 6.30 in the morning for two weeks trying to get it done in time. And the amount of effort and caring and imaginative expenditure that went into pretending I was Frank Sinatra and trying to really get into it and when I and like nothing came of it I did get paid that's good but can other any than of that, that go into a novel any of that energy yeah, I mean or? I could write a novel about Frank Sinatra 
I actually have thought about doing that. Yeah. And I think I'd this, actually really like to read that. Yeah? Yeah, I would, seriously. I mean, this one was set at the end of his, this movie was going to be, it was an adaptation of the famous Gay Talese article, Frank Sinatra Has a Cold, so, yeah. which is a wonderful idea for a movie. It's because it's just this slice of his life in November 1965 when he's still at the peak of his fame, his second time he's had his big comeback, and he seems like he's cock of the walk, but he's actually... And only we know it in hindsight. This is the end, just before the big decline for him in terms of cultural irrelevance and so on. You know, the Beatles are right. already happening and all that stuff. Youth culture is about to leave him completely behind. And in a couple of years, he's going to be embarrassing himself on the, like the Smothers Brothers show, wearing love beads and a Nehru jacket and looking ridiculous. So it's this great moment in time, and it's got Mia Farrow was his girlfriend then, and. Um, but if I did do it as a novel, I think I would go more toward the early days of his life and the but love with Ava Gardner. But he could be the ghost Frank Sinatra, the phantom Frank Sinatra. Yes. The parallel version, but not the real. I mean, I'm, oh, I'm loving interesting. this. Interesting. You could do like a Godfather fan fiction thing where you did like the story of, totally. what's his name, Johnny Fontaine? Is that yeah. the, so not, yeah. the singer? Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, a cool yeah, idea. Yeah. Then I get sued by the Puzo estate. Um, <laughs> I really had meant to leave time for you guys to ask questions, and I didn't. I'm sorry. Aww, it's done. That's I mean, right. unless like one person has a question that's so burning and poignant and right on the money, and not a rambling statement of their own life disappointments. <laughs> Does anybody have one of those? Or not? Oh, yes, you do. Knock it out. Speak a little bit about, about the real stories you heard from your grandfather. My, my, we that's, a went, good, that's a good note to end on. So you mean... The real stories he heard from his grandfather. When he was, when my, gra my real grandfather was really dying and I was listening to him. Um, yeah, I mean, the, mod, the frame for this book is drawn from the real experience I have of, of going to see my grandfather just before he died. And he was in terminal stages of cancer and he was on heavy duty painkillers, Dilaudid, and his and he was just zo zo zoning in and out of different periods of his life and telling, just the, whatever came to mind. He was, I was hearing things. Um, uh, it was a lot, a lot of it was early childhood stuff. And I, and in a way I was not true to that in this book um, in that I heard much more, it, it were, his memory seemed to have been pushed into his earliest years in a way that it hadn't ever been in my hearing before. Um, so I was hearing about his siblings as kids and um, things he remembered. Now, he grew up in New York City, not in Philadelphia, like the grandfather in the book. And um, so I was hearing things about the Bronx when he was a kid. Um, and the one, um, the one thing he re told me that made it fully into the novel, essentially unaltered except that it happens in Philadelphia in the book is he um, told me about having dropped a kitten out of a third story window on purpose when he was about four or five years old just to see what would happen if you did. And without a sense like I'm going to kill this kitten by dropping it out of a window, but just like I wonder what will happen to this kitten if I drop it out of this window. And um, you know, not only was I a little surprised to hear that from him, but what really surprised me is he had this weird look of I won't say glee on his face, but it was just sort of like a, he looked wonderstruck. Maybe it was just that the thought that he had ever been somebody that would do something like that, I don't know, but there was this kind of weird, slightly sinister smile on his face as he remembered this thing, and it so didn't comport with the kind of person I thought he was, or what, some, you know, uh, that, that he would ever have done. That I think that's where the seeds were really planted for me, although I didn't know it at the time, but this idea that there's, that what's, I mean, we know, all, we all know that we have no access whatsoever to the thoughts, feelings, or emotions of any other of person around us except through what they tell us, um, which is, you know, at best, partial. And um, except through reading, right? I mean, it's through reading that we, at least feel like we have full and complete access to the hearts and minds of other people. And, um, you know, that's 
being startled by hearing my grandfather and, and that being a clue to me, which it seems obvious, but I don't think we'd really do think this way. Like, wow, there's, there's so much about him I don't know. There's, and what isn't he telling me? And what, what, like all this stuff I'm hearing has been there all these years and he's never said anything about it. And I'm just hearing what's, none of this is being prompted by me asking questions. It's all just surfacing and what, what am I not hearing? What, and, what, and his wife, had, my grandmother had already been dead for uh, almost two years at that point and what, I didn't even get to have this with her. So what was there? What didn't I hear? The being dressed up like a boy part of her right. never came out and ever. So, you know, that I think it was almost as important to me were, were the things I wasn't hearing from my grandfather as, as the things that I did hear. He remembered things about me when I was little that he had, I had never heard before and about my mom and her siblings. And, um, you know, it was nothing calamitous, except for if you're a kitten. <laughs> it's always better when we make it up. It's always better when we make yeah. it up. And that's why so much, many of us do make it up. Make and, it up. You know, and, and our stories are, and I mean, this is true with memoirs too, and I'm sitting beside somebody who wrote a very beautiful, um, has written memoirs that are, you know, very beautiful and profound and true. It's not so many memoirs. I mean, some memoirs are deliberately trying to deceive people. We've all heard about them. Mm -hmm. Some of them have been on Oprah. Um, <laughs> but, um, but what we remember, it's not even what we say or write that's an invention. It's what we remember, too, is an invention. Yeah. And it's an invention in ways that we are often not even aware anymore um, right. that it, we made it all up or that we, or it didn't happen like that at all. And that's what produces those jarring moments with one's siblings, for example, where you, something comes up that you haven't talked about in 30 years. Like, remember that yeah. time when mom and dad, blah, 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 and your brother's like, dad wasn't there. Yes, he was. I remember dad was there. Like, no, he wasn't. Dad was not there. And, and you can't resolve that, right? In the future when everything is recorded and stored in the cloud, you know, I, we'll be able to rerun the tape. I, what's going to happen in marriages when you can when just you can roll actually the tape? Like, I never said because that. Because the Excuse kitchen me. is, the kitchen Siri, camera is going. Siri, can you replay the argument from three months ago? <laughs> <laughs> just imagine that. Maybe that will be a good thing. I think that's a good note to end on. <laughs> okay. um, I want to I want to say a couple of things. Um, I actually bought seven copies of this book today, uh, and I and I really don't know that I have ever done that before. But it, it's a great book. We have first editions of the great book, and you'll really want to give it to people. It will be wonderful. The second thing I want to say is that Michael has to make a plane. So when you're going through the signing line, please be thoughtful and just time aware and don't, don't spill your whole soul. Okay, wait, um, can I say something? Yes. How awesome is this woman? Oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thank you thank so you. much for coming. Thank you for coming on this dreary Sunday. Thank you so much. It's been great. Thank you. Mm -hmm.